Hi, welcome to Crime in the Mitten. We are your hosts, I'm Shelby. And I'm Aliyah. Every week, you'll hear a new true crime story based in Michigan, from the mysterious missing cases to the gruesome murders that left the police struggling to stay on the scene. We're giving you the inside scoop on what's going on in our Mitten State. Tune in every Wednesday for your weekly dose of Michigan true crime. Because this episode may contain information about killings of children, viewer discretion and reader's discretion is advised. Before I start, I want to make a comment that last week, Leah, we said that we were going to go digital and look at us. We are both digital now. (laughs) We are no no longer reading scripts from papers. We are doing it (laughs) off our phones. All right. Hello, ladies and gents. She'll be here. And today I would like to talk to you about death. I mean, you kind of knew what you were asking for when you hit that play button. (laughs) We decided to try something new for our episode today. We come across a lot of cases we want to tell you about, but there's just not enough information on it. So we've decided to dedicate one episode out of the month where we bring you short cases that can't quite make a full episode. Honestly, I'm really geeked to do this because when I would search for more cases, I would find some that I immediately had to add on my list off the little description I read. And then that little description is all there is to it. Yeah, no, the description, like, you know, you would think, like, that's, like, the capture, like, that's, like, the capture you win. They was like, no, 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 no that's, that, that's, it. that's the case. You Google 10 other articles and they all the exact same. Exactly. It's literally the same little paragraph. The sorry paragraph, too, where you'd be like, I'm just going to write five sentences. <laughs> yeah, that kind of paragraph. <laughs> Passing for, like, a first grader when you're learning the right <laughs> Exactly. That's what they look like. That, yeah, and it's annoying, but... This episode, we're putting an end to that. Leah and I will go back and forth sharing short cases we've came across while doing our research. And here's Aaliyah to start us off. So, my first case, I honestly thought it was a movie title. Like a movie <laughs> title or like something that'll just capture you in. It's an actual case. And I had to do it because... <laughs> of course. I had to. So, Kip's Pizza and Taco House. No, Kip's Pizza Taco House. <laughs> a and taco house? A pizza taco p- Pizza taco house. Yeah, pizza taco house. Not pizza and taco, just pizza taco house. Never heard of that before. Me either. Okay. And it's in Michigan. So. Is it Michigan? Yeah. Is, uh, okay, cool. I mean, of course. <laughs> It'll, it, okay. <laughs> I had a moment. <laughs> you know, as a big fan of pizza and tacos, I, Taco Tuesday every week, of I course. had to do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's only right. Right. But I had to make sure I put it on my list before she'll be added it to hers. Of so, course. Because it's yeah. kind of cutthroat on adding things to our list. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, I thought it was like a movie title because I saw Pizza Place Murder. That sounds like a movie title. No, it do. It sounds so, exactly like a movie. But a man and his wife owned a pizza taco restaurant in Jackson, Michigan. The couple lived in an apartment attached to the back of the restaurant. So they lived and worked together. Oh, that's a lot. A lot. A lot of interaction. (laughs) A lot. There's no break. No break. Can't even get mad and go to work. (laughs) I'll be down there in two. (laughs) So they were a seemingly seemingly happy couple when they had been married for 10 years. There were plenty of speculations, but it's unknown exactly why he did it but july 1999 arts beat his wife with a metal pipe as she was sitting on the couch in their home he placed her in a sleeping bag and took her to the restaurant where he dismembered her body then baked broiled and fried her corpse over two days that's a little excessive don't you think yes (laughs) oh wow I'm getting, like, Jeffrey Dahmer, (laughs) Ted Bundy, all those kind of vibes, all mixed in one. Overkill. So, um, Patricia's family called to check in on her because they hadn't heard of her in those, from her in those two days. Mm -hmm. And her husband basically just said, like, they got into an argument and she left in near Lincoln. But they knew that was a lie because... They had just sold the Lincoln because they were having money issues. So mm. she talks to her family. So she let them know, like, we had to yeah, sell Yeah, like, the we car. recently sold the car. Right. And, like, you know, that just comes up in, like, regular conversation. Regular like, like, yeah. Because people are going to even ask, though, like, yeah, hey, what'd what you do with the car? the car? Yeah, no, we sold it. Now. So, okay. Cool. Not, like, right. wasn't making yourself look too good. <laughs> no. 
you know, they sold they they had to sell the car, so mm-hmm. her family's like, Yeah, that's not true. So they filed a missing persons report. When the police arrived at the home to question him, he was carrying a box and then set it on the neighbor's porch. On the neighbor's porch, the neighbor's like porch. not my problem. Basically. Wow. He's like, somebody's going to go down for this, but it ain't me. <laughs> it's not going to be me. I would be p- mad to be that neighbor. Like, you going to bring this to my front step? Wow. Okay. So, after questioning, the police went over to check inside the box. And there was a human skull in flesh. Wow. Just in the box that he set on the neighbor's porch. That is messed up. Right. They went in the kitchen of the restaurant and noticed... Burnt flesh on the counter. The crime lab sprayed um, luminol in the, like all over the kitchen and mm-hmm. found to check for blood. And they noticed it was like the entire kitchen was lit up. Lit up like a Christmas tree. So it was blood all over the kitchen. Wow. Ars was arrested and on suspicion of a murder. During his trial, witnesses came for saying that Arts was obsessed with murder and claimed that years ago he explained to them how he would go about disposing a body. So he told them how he would do it? Mm -hmm. And then did it. And then did it. Like... (laughs) <laughs> I know I told you already this is how I'm going to do it. But the thing but is, it's I'm not even like... Anyway, I'm it, not going to switch up the plan. Not even that. It's just like, you told someone. Like, that's a bold thing to do. And then to be like, like did it, that's a bold move to do. Like, yeah. you're going to do something. Keep it to yourself. Keep it to yourself. That's how Don't you get just caught. Don't telling everybody. Right. Arts um, allegedly said that he would cut up the body, boil the parts, and to get rid of all the evidence. Others claim that months before murdering his wife, he <laughs> he questioned he questioned how he could kill his wife, like just going around asking people, like, "Hey, he was doing a poll this. on the street, like you know how they be doing those like interviews and stuff like that, <laughs> random questions, like what secrets that you never told your mom? Hey, so if you was to kill your wife hypothetically, how would um, you do it? How you would, that is, and no one group guy got suspicious off of that and was just like, yeah, maybe we should report maybe this we guy. Report him. Do like, where's your wife at? That no, that's he was bold. He was a bold man, super bold. Yeah, he was a very curious man. As I, I also want to add. <laughs> so there were many speculations as to why Arts murdered his wife. One of the facts that, um. He had surgery for a blood clot on his brain in June, like just a couple weeks before Mm -hmm. he killed her. He killed her, Patricia. Some of Patricia's family members believe that he suffered from brain damage, like Mm post-surgery. Like he didn't remember, really remember who they were. And he, um, oh, he couldn't read and write well. So So they just. After the brain injury? after After the surgery. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it kind of seemed like it was like a a pretty serious one if like it affected things like that. Mm-hmm. Another um another was that he was taking Prozac on a regular basis for his depression. Mm-hmm. And after the doctors discovered the blood clot, he had to stop taking the, the Prozac until after the surgery. And there could be harsh side effects if you just stop taking antidepressants yeah. like all of a sudden. Just like cold turkey. Yeah. So there was, you could have suicidal thoughts, anxiety, mood swings, like stuff like that. And so that's, of course, they're like, it could have been this. Mm-hmm. It kind of drives me crazy how people always try to look for like a mental illness mm-hmm. when like something happens. The they're like, of, like, yeah, like, like oh, well, he had a brain injury when he was like two, <laughs> and they're like, well, he lived this basic like life. you know this this life and then like all of a sudden it's like it just kicked like i'm not saying like it's not possible but it's just right, like it's that's just... everyone always goes back to like everyone always has Mental a brain illness injury in video games yeah oh yeah that's another one <laughs> so like everybody just always goes back goes to the excuse of like there it must have been because of a brain injury no some people are just sick or like some people just snap yeah but um he was they also say he was paranoid that his wife was trying to kill him with bug spray Hmm. So, I'm pretty sure she could have found a lot, ways. yeah, a lot quicker ways. Because 
If she was trying, obviously he wasn't doing much. <laughs> he was paranoid, the depression, the the brain clot, all of that, the mm-hmm. blood clot. So according to his attorney, the paranoia was due to uh, was due to trauma in his brain, which made him suffer from delusions. Others mentioned that his wife had an issue with his usage of marijuana, which started an argument and eventually led to her death. See, now they're making people who smoke uh, marijuana look bad now. Like, we just, like, we, you just blow up and stuff. That <laughs> It's you always that one person that always messes it up for the rest of us. And they're like, well, you know what? <laughs> we need to be like, maybe we need to put an end to it then. Cause if it, it's always that one person. <sighs> oh, gosh. <laughs> like, they're already looking for reasons to be like, the only reason it was legalized is so that people, I mean, that the government could tax off of it. If it was no other way. <laughs> They would use any. They would make anything like this right here would have been the reason. They like, yeah, we're just gonna keep it illegal. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it happened in '99, and look where we are. Yeah, eleven years later. Very true. It was also thought that he killed Patricia because of his hallucinations, and when he looked at her, he saw the devil. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm pretty sure a lot of husbands feel that way about their wife sometimes, but you don't see them killing them. Killing them. Cooking them and and broiling their skin. Okay. Cool. (sighs) Right. Art's lawyer said that Art's was guilty, but that he should not be found guilty by reason of insanity. He said that he was was mentally ill and suffered from bleeding on the brain. Jurors disagreed with the attorney, and in March... Of 2001, Arts was given life without parole sentence. He is incarcerated in Gus Harrison Correctional Facility in Adrian, Michigan. In 2008, he requested for a new trial under the premise that he was suffering from marijuana psychosis. The fact that... (laughs) The fact that his use of marijuana was mentioned during the court testimony, it was never questioned whether it could cause, um, it could have been a cause for the crime or not. Arch tried getting a new trial, but was unsuccessful and his appeal was denied. Before we move on, marijuana does not... And it does not cause you to rage out. I thought it, it, the most you want to do is attack a fridge. <laughs> that's all. The only thing that's not it's safe not when you when you smoke marijuana is Twinkies. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so the fact that to use that that okay, we don't yeah, li- we don't like you, with. Arts. <laughs> you that's can't sit with, with us. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, so the um, I first heard about. The, oh, so the case I'm going to do, the short case I found, is about Juwan Numar Deering. And I first heard about Juwan uh, Deering from an article that popped up in the suggestions when I was doing research on the Miss and Skelton's brother's case, which if you haven't heard that episode, you guys should check it out. What drew me to the Deering case was the fact that he set out set a house on fire and murdered people all over a $200 drug deal. And that was like literally like the cap, like that was the caption. Yeah. So that was like the caption of it, like the little three sentences mm-hmm. we were talking about. That was that. That was it. Then I began to really look into this case, and I admit I was not ready for what I found out. On April 6, back in 2000, in Royal Oak Township, a boy by the name of Eugene Deere was celebrating his sixth birthday. Celebrating his birthday with him were his siblings, Talia, Craig, Aaron, four more siblings whose names I couldn't find, and their cousin, Michelle Frame. I remember having birthday parties like this growing up, and they were lit. <laughs> like, especially because I have a big family already. Yeah. And so when my cousin came over, we knew, like, for sure it was about to be a good time. It was about to be a good time. Yeah, so I can imagine how much fun these kids were having. Around 11 p.m. that night, the family porch was doused in charcoal and lighter fluid and ignited, causing the dean's home to catch fire. Marie Dean was able to escape the house with four of her children, Rescuers were able to pull Eugene, Craig, and Aaron from the fire, but they later died. Talia and Michelle were upstairs in the bedroom and died from smoke ventilation. As if this wasn't heartbreaking enough for not only Marie Dean and Michelle's dad, they had to wait six years for justice to be served for the murder of their children. Investigators had someone in mind, but they didn't act quick on it. 
which this would cause like a like a, a lot of people like this would drew attention to the case because mm-hmm. people were like, why did it take six years for anything to be for done? Anything. Yeah. So several months later, Deering was jailed for resisting arrest during a traffic stop. An informant was put in the same cell as Deering in hopes he could get something out of him about the Dean's home murder. Deering actually told the informant that he was working on an alibi and that he wanted to take antidepressants to throw off a polygraph. What? Yeah. Just, bi- just pillow talk. <laughs> <laughs> just a little pillow talk, you know. But this wasn't enough for investigators to act on it, I guess. In 2003... Daring was jailed again, but this time for a probation violation. Another informant was sent in to try to get information out of him about the Dean's home fire. This time, the informant was able to get a lot more out of him than the first one. Daring told him that he only wanted to send a message to Big Mike and that he never meant to harm any kids. Now, Big Mike was the kid's father, and apparently he was the one who owed Daring $200 over some drugs. So he set their house on fire for $200. $200 in drugs. Like, the $200. Like, but, the, like, move on. Like, you don't even know if you're going to really get your target. Right. It's a whole house, a whole family. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like you're not even taking in consideration the neighbor, like, you know, the house is next to it and no. stuff. Like, no. So something that made my stomach drop when reading this was that Big Mike wasn't even at the home at the time of the fire. He was in rehab being treated for his drug addiction. And a month after the fire that killed four out of eight of his kids, he died due to heart-related problems. Wow. In 2006, Darren was finally taken into custody for murder and arson. The bailiff told authorities that he overheard Deering say that the jailhouse snitches, the jailhouse snitches uh, wouldn't leave jail alive. So it was like he really had loose lips uh, about everything. Like, Every, like, he, he talked told. to the informants, he making comments to the bailiff. Like, he was just a talkative guy. I wonder if he was a Capricorn. <laughs> Capricorns are really talkative. <laughs> Three informants testified against Deering. One stating he said, I didn't mean for them damn kids to die. That's 21. Insensitive. Yeah, that was, it, and it is insensitive. It's like when you go back and you repeat it, it's like, you really don't wow. sound remorseful it's At just all. like shit it, it, it happened they got caught in a crossfire Ugh, like a little Try more compassion right so 21 people who were family and friends and people who just hung around Deering on a daily basis testified as well they stated that Deering had admitted that he was tired of big mike bullshitting him during the trial Deering seemed overwhelmed by the seriousness of the charges he was facing when he was picked up the last time, he thought it was for another parole violation. Didn't even know that he was getting arrested. Because obviously, he's like, I didn't got away with it. It's six years now. It's not even his head anymore. And although he had a rap sheet with crimes like possession of narcotics and, <laughs> yeah, and fleeing authorities, murder was now being added to it. And that's a much serious crime. Years later. Yeah, years later at that. The verdict was delayed two hours so that Marie Dean and Michelle's father could hear. The judge's heart broke when he realized that it was Eugene's sixth birthday and that he didn't even get 24 hours to be six. Deering was charged with five counts of murder and one count of arson. First degree murder is the most serious criminal charge in Michigan law and is punishable by mandatory life in prison without possibility for parole. So Deering, of course, was sentenced to life in prison, life in prison. The case gained a little notoriety from what people said were the county's failure to pursue Deering after like it took six years. It was said that charges were only brought up after a certain prosecuting attorney resigned after allegations of professional misconduct. Investigators believed that he might have buried Deering's case but couldn't come up with a reason why. Whatever the reason is, I'm just glad justice was finally served for Talia, Craig, Aaron, Eugene, and Michelle. Yeah. I mean, it took forever, but it at took, least it was done. Yeah, it took six years, but sometimes it's just like, as long as it, it's done. It's, it's like done. somebody is paying for it. Like, he shouldn't be able to see the light of day. No. At all. Especially because he talked so much about it. It's not mm-hmm. like he was, he didn't even care that he did it. He wasn't even like a remorseful one. Like, you yeah. know, like, the or like, like I'm going to keep it to myself. And I feel like when you go to jail and you talk about like, because I feel like in jail, in like prison and stuff it's serious when you do certain crimes and they will like involving kids especially so you just went in there just blabbing at the mouth like 
Like, oh, yeah, what you here for? Oh, yeah, I did this, 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 and this. Oh. Right, like... So you want to then at the same time, the story, didn't right? nobody ever tell you to like your mom would be like, like shut your mouth, like shut up. You, you, talk too much. Yeah, you do. <laughs> like, but I mean, like in the sake that it did give the kid, it, it was justice for the family. Like, mm-hmm. thank goodness he did run his mouth. But you like you, he, he better not ever open his mouth to be like, like how did this happen to me? I yeah, <laughs> like at all. Nobody ever told him secrets, right? <laughs> <laughs> he cannot hold water. <laughs> So, my last case is about Eric Cross. Eric Cross was 16 years old, and he was, him him and his family were new to the small town in Vicksburg, Michigan. On the night of June 26, 1983, Eric got ready to go to a graduation party. It was $2 to get in, then all you can, all you can drink once you're actually in. Turn up. That's not like death. (laughs) That sounds like the place I want to be. <laughs> Tend up. I can like tell a huge difference in like hanging out with my 22 year old, 22, 23 year old friends and then hanging out with our 21 year old friends. <laughs> it's such a huge difference. It is a big difference. A year is a like, big difference. All right. It's nap time. Like, what y'all mean, nap time? Let's go. No, I my, just want to take a nap. My first. pre-grade, my pre-game now is a nap. Is so a nap. it's like, oh, if I don't take this pre-game nap, I'm not going. <laughs> I'm not going nowhere. Like, At just, all. Just let me get. The, y'all so lame. Like I just, I just asked for a 20 minute just, nap. That's all I wanted. <laughs> Maybe 15. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tuesday, you know? <laughs> I gotta work in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but they were 16, so of course they like all pumped up, well, 16 through 18, they all pumped up, ready to go drink for the whole night. Not me. But <laughs> <laughs> Eric was really close to his younger sister, Jackie. Jackie knew about the party, but of course his parents did not. Mm-hmm. So the party was at a, at a lake house about a mile away from his home, and it was a big party, like people from... Indiana were coming up to this party like it was oh, like a really, Project X type of was, I actually put your address <laughs> on a radio station kind of party. It was a big party. So Eric had a good time at the party with his friends and he walked home from the party that night but never made it into his house. He got drunk during he was drunk during the night the dark walk home at 2 a.m. and maybe not maybe drunk enough for him not to realize that someone was following him. Mm. His father heard Eric at the door that morning and rolled back over to go back to sleep, not realizing that Eric never even made it into the house. The door was locked, so Eric was locked out. No one knows what actually happened next, other than Eric and the people who did it to him. Ted Cross, Eric's father, was was waking up, or was woken up, around 5 a.m. by a car turning around in his driveway. It was a loud car, like the muffler was knee repairing or just wasn't mm-hmm. there at all. You ever hear that Sada Baby song? He's like, I can hear him coming because it's car loud. <laughs> <laughs> Who would ever knew you could Michigan quote... Reference. That's Who... just a Detroit reference. <laughs> Who ever knew that we could incorporate Sada Baby into our True Kind <laughs> podcast just now? <laughs> Epic moment. We need to write write this down. <laughs> write this down. <laughs> and you didn't even have this on camera. You know what? <laughs> I didn't even record it. God. <laughs> he got up to go outside to get the newspaper. As he went down the walkway, he noticed Eric's shoe in the street. As he got closer, he noticed his son's body in a ditch in front of their home. All of his belongings were scattered along the road. Taya ran back into the house to get his wife. She went out with a blanket to wrap Eric up. They went to the neighbor who worked in the medical field in hopes that they could help her son, but they couldn't help. Eric was dead. The the ambulance came, and they also tried to save him. Ted and Mary Lou Cross had to break the news to their young daughter about her big brothers that she was so close to, who she was so close to. She knew... Without them having even say anything to her, she knew her brother was gone. Mm, you just had like a feeling. Just that feeling. When sheriffs arrived, they knew it was more than just a hit and run. 
There was so much evidence stretched stretched across the road. Neighbors saw a dark colored car with a noisy muffler. What there there were there were three people in the car, two men and a woman and a woman. All three were white. When the neighbor saw the car, one of the three in the car yelled, They saw us. No one at the no one at the party that night the night before was really willing to give police any information. They were all underage. Right. So they're at like a drinking party. Yeah. So they're like, yeah, my no, parents probably no. didn't, didn't even know half the ki- majority of those kids were even there. So even if they didn't get in trouble with the police, they still had their parents mm-hmm. who would not be happy at all with oh. them being at a drinking party. And all you can drink party. All you can drink party for $2. Dude, honestly, I think the parents would be more peed off that they didn't have anything for them like that, too. I'd be insulted if my kid was like, yeah, I was at a $2 party. Like, you didn't get, where was mine? Like, like, where was, this shouldn't even be for y'all. Like, this is, who's Who creating these events? <laughs> Who so now, supplied this event? Very true. Very true. But yeah, I, I can see why, like, they struggled with, like, cooperation for yeah. sure. Yeah. Eric wasn't just run over. He was beaten. He was tied up around the neck. He had cu- he had a cut on his back, and his legs were broken. That's a lot for like a mm-hmm. for it to just be a hit and run. And he was dragged by a car. Wow. Police follow every lead. Had many tips called in and interviewed many people. The one name that was mentioned plenty of times was Brett Spalding. Brett went to the school went to school with Eric. He attended the party with his girlfriend Amber Thomas. Many witnesses say that Eric and Amber were flirting and Brett wasn't happy with it. It was said that Brett pushed Eric because of it. Brett Spalding was said to be the bully and then kind of out of control. The dark colored mini mid sized car that the cross's neighbor described was the same kind of car that Brett had. Mm. The car that car suddenly disappeared after that party, possibly given to a family member out of state. Out of nowhere, you just being generous. Just give your car away. Mm-hmm. I don't see people just giving out cars like that. Right. They're not. It's not pieces of candy. <laughs> Especially like at that age too. At that like, age, you are not giving. Up it's your not. Car. Yeah, it's not like you have like. I oh, I can get another one. Like, <laughs> all right, grandma just gonna have to wait because I need my car. <laughs> exactly, grandma shouldn't be driving. <laughs> <laughs> Police searched all over for his car. Brett was at the party with both his girlfriend and Bill Cook. Bill Cook was also a friend was also friends with Eric and he said that he and Eric got separated that night of the party. Bill left with his girlfriend, then spent the night at the Spalding home. Eric's family waited for years for to hear something from the police. But they got nothing. Years passed, still nothing. In 2001, close to two decades later, the Kalamazoo uh, County Police took a look at took a look into the cold case. The now adults who were teens when it happened still weren't talking. They That's were crazy because you would think like, all right, you, your parents aren't harboring over right. you and stuff like that. I'm it's pretty sure it's talk. been even you. Like I would hope you had a guilty con- uh, conscience. So. Say something. Just, just tell now. It's, right, it's, y'all all grown. Yeah, it's help. <laughs> I'm sure at this point your parents knew you were at that party. Oh yeah, For, you got caught. Like a two, like they, you, they knew the night they came home and their kids was like, <laughs> <laughs> the kids was topsy turvy. So <laughs> just say, speak up. They worked for a year on the case before they let it go. They still had nothing. They still did not have the murder weapon. In 2010, Eric's sister started a Facebook page for Eric. The page gained over 600 friends. It was so many years later, everyone thought the case was closed. Everyone knew who who drove the dark color car that night. Everyone knew knew what had happened, but none of them but none of that could be proven in court. Right. So it's just so, like like those like the town knows, but like it's, no it's just like it's just proved. like town it's news, just, right. right? Like we just like we all know what happened, but even, that's even can't everybody happen. that like moved away from the town after the Facebook page was open, everybody was shocked because they thought it was over with. Right? Wow. 
The main suspects in Eric's, Eric's case were Brett Spalding, his father, Brian Spalding Sr., Amber Thomas, Tim Martin, and Tim Cook. Hmm. Brett's father was a suspect because if the car really was given away or mm-hmm. disappeared, no matter where it was, Dad, Dad has he has something and that's like getting rid of the evidence. Right yeah, there. and then even if he didn't even like help initially with the car, where's your, where's where's your car at? Where the car? You, you don't know where of, your son's car is. All of a sudden, you needing rides again. No, where where is your car? And it, you can't even say that like it's like a baseball hat or something. You'd be like, I let my friend borrow it for three weeks now. I mean, my brother asked me to borrow like my car for two weeks before. And I was like, <laughs> you, you openly ask people that question? But <laughs> like if, you're, if your kid's car disappeared, I'm, I'm definitely sure you're going to notice that. You- you notice your that's a big cars. that's no a longer there. that's a big investment that's just missing out of the driveway. <laughs> <clears throat> Brett was arrested in 2016 for five months, but had nothing to do with Eric's case. This wasn't Brett's first arrest. He was constantly in and out of prison. During his time in prison, they police still couldn't find any proof to keep him any longer for Eric's murder. Anytime Brett has to go to court for anything, a group of people wearing shirts saying justice for Eric Cross show up to court just to remind, just to remind him, like, we know you mm-hmm. did it and one day you will you get caught. Still make him feel like, no, we didn't get over We, You still need to pay for mm-hmm. it. And a constant reminder, as they should. Good for them. So... The last case I'm, we're going to talk about is Christopher James Dankovich. And it's crazy because, like, my mom was in the room with me when I, like, was reading about this case mm-hmm. a little bit. And, like, she, like, looked up and was like, WTF. Like, <laughs> <laughs> because it definitely, like, you can see why the caption of it got my attention. So 16-year-old Christopher James Dankovich, and sorry if I'm saying his name wrong. To many was far from violent, or so they thought, until one day, April 24th, 2005 to be exact, Christopher stabbed his mother 111 times in the head, eyes, neck, and back in their home in Rochester. But why? That is always the golden question in true crime, well, in life in general. See, at the time, Christopher's mother, Diane Michelle, caught him watching porn and also caught wind that he was browsing websites focused on making weapons. You know, oh, that's one extreme to the next one. It, it, it really is. Like you know, at first, because at first when they first said like he was watching like porn, I was like, okay, well, like he's at that age and it's like that. But then she said that, and I was like, oh no, 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 I see why she was like no, that. That's concerning. Yeah, give me the computer. <laughs> like, let me try give to vote. <laughs> you you don't know you don't you can't handle that responsibility yet. So Christopher's um, mother finds out that he she catches wind of this. And I even read that he either made or attempted to make a weapon that projected items like a um, pipe at gun power speed. Like, so he put a, huh? it was like a pipe. He made this like this. It was like a gun pretty much, but it shot out a pipe instead. Is there a picture of this somewhere? You know, I couldn't find one. Great. The, you know, the, the, the lovely benefits of having a short case episode because you can't find nothing. I was like, this is the kind of stuff that people need to see. <laughs> I'm like, cause, I mean, not to like to give notes, but like, what does it look like? <laughs> like? How did you accomplish that? So, it was claimed that the reason for these searches were not for what you would think a 16 year old boy would want to do, which I mean, we already just kind of drew up some conclusions. Right. He wanted to save the babies, and that means getting rid of abortion, or at least people who support it. When Christopher's mother confronted him about these findings, he lashed out, stabbed her 111 times, and fled the home in his mom's white Astro van with no license. So he was just, Riding he was dirty. just going to make, make the great escape. Didn't think anybody was going to be looking for her truck, and he get pulled over. He just... License and registration. Like, I'm, I don't even think he thought about... No, he just... That. No. Nope. So Christopher ran off to a family cabin in Roscommon County. Around 8 a.m., Diane's mother... So he didn't even go far. No, he didn't go far. You will, If you're going to run, you got to run for real. Like, Aaliyah, he probably didn't know how to drive <laughs> far. He started being like, oh, 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 this is a lot harder than Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really hit people in Grand Theft Auto, you know, in real life. 
So Diane, um, her mother finds the body of her daughter after Christopher's father asks her to stop by and check on Diane after not being able to get in contact with her. Her body was laying in the family's foyer with a tarp partially covering her body. Police were able to collect a blue hand, a blue handled knife with blood and hair on it. Bloody clothes in the laundry room and blood droplets and blood in the sink as well. So he was bad at all of this. He did not. No, he. You know what? He's sixteen. He's barely cleaning up his room, let alone a crime scene. But if you watching, if you googling all of this stuff, and I'm sure he was watching stuff, like you would think he had more sense than this. You know, some people like to skip through certain parts of like videos. He probably skipped through cleanup <laughs> every time. The, the cleanup and the that, running part. Like, y- yeah. <laughs> Like this, it wasn't like, and this was definitely like a rash, like spare the moment kind of lash out because like no thought was put into this. Nothing. Like, police immediately start the hunt for Christopher. Police feared that not only was he a threat to others, but a threat to himself as well. The next day, the van was spotted at the cabin by <laughs> authorities, and so they they call you know they called other like called in backup and told them like, hey, he he's at this cabin. We got him. Yeah. So before going into the cabin, police actually called Christopher's phone, but there was no answer. Which was so friendly. <laughs> then they then approached the cabin, calling out on a bullhorn to Christopher. He surrendered without giving the police any problem. I mean, he kind of it's kind of like he had a sign that said, "I'm right here." I'm here. So you he couldn't took go the car. Out. Yeah. His mother's car and went to the family. You didn't hide it when you parked cabin. it. I think he wasn't going to get caught. That's not like the first place they think like you got any properties that he might go to. <laughs> so Christopher said that he had planned on going south into hiding, which was pretty evident because his freshly dyed blue hair was shaved off. Yeah, I'm honestly I can't even look at him like crazy because you know I do all these crazy dyes. So when I see net, you dye your hair, but Shelby, you you not killing nobody when you dye your hair. Yeah, I know that. I'm not shaving it off either. <laughs> like, that is very true. So Christopher was brought to Oakland County Jail via helicopter for some reason, and yeah, so I just he got a, a helicopter ride. I never <laughs> been on a helicopter before. I ain't killing nobody. That, that. So despite what had happened, Christopher's family supported him 100% through things. And although many described him as someone they'd at least expect to be violent, he was held with no bond. He was a flight risk. I mean, I, I he, w- he ran the first not. time. <laughs> yeah. Christopher's lawyer believed that this was a mental health issue. How did he end up with a lawyer? Court appointed. Or, you know, I think the family actually paid for a lawyer. Because the family, the family was still support. Like they, although it was like you know, you killed your mother. They were still there with him the entire time. Like in a courtroom, they would yell like, "We love you" and stuff I like. I understand that. the love, but like, if you did it, you did it. You gotta go. Cause I'm now I'm scared for my life. You're not about to live with me, get an argument with me, and I'd be dead. Very true. So Christopher's lawyer had believed that it was a, a mental issue, and he con- constantly mentioned an insanity defense. A plea deal for 22 and a half years was rejected by the judge because he stated that it was too light for the crime committed. In the end, though, Christopher was charged with second degree murder, not premeditated. And instead of going to trial, Christopher really just wanted to own up to what he did and face his punishment. A psychologist stated that he was going to be a threat once out due to the fact that he strongly believed in what he stood for and for and will lash out on anyone who stands in his way like he did with his mother. Which is a pretty good, obviously, like good, high, you know, like kind of guess theory. Christopher was charged as an adult and is currently serving a sentence of twenty-five to thirty-seven years, and will be eligible for parole in twenty thirty. And although there weren't many articles on Christopher, I did stumble over this site called Prison Writers, where Christopher published short stories about his experience being in prison at a young age. And I read through most of the stories already, and they're actually really worth taking a look into. Like, they were actually pretty interesting. Yeah, no, they were actually, like, he, he was, like, they were well written, and, like, they were pretty good stories. Like, they're really short, though, too, so it was, like, easy to Mm -hmm. go through them, too. Yeah, You know, obviously, we had to have, like, short stories, because we got to do so much research all the time. It's like, I don't have time to sit here and read I don't. I don't even have time to watch TV. I know. I I know. (laughs) We'll leave a link to that on our website uh, as well, though. So we hope you guys enjoyed our short case episode. And next month we're going to bring 
what four more we did four four, four more, more cases yeah. to you guys that can't quite make enough information for their own hour. And it was actually cool because I know Leah been talking about this pizza case for a while now. This pizza taco yeah, I thought thing. It was I, a real, I thought it was a long case. So I thought it was going to be one of my real Yeah, cases you know what? You did. <laughs> so I was like, I eventually wanted to hear about that, though. So we're going to do a question today. And the generator pulled up number. And why don't we ever get, like, number one or two? I, I don't know. I literally just put in the generator <laughs> one to three thousand. <laughs> Okay, so the number is 2,962. There are so many smaller numbers. So what celebrity would you want as one of your BFFs? Do we consider each other celebrities? Because I'll just say, Leah, you could be my best friend. <laughs> We're not there yet. <laughs> if I could have a celebrity for a best friend, I think it would be like, it would be Rihanna. Honestly? Yeah. Yeah. Rihanna will be lit. You gotta be lit. Like when she did, when she, I forgot what award show she was at, and she walked. They called her name. No, they they did something. They wouldn't do something for her, and she took a stack of money and threw it in their face, like mm, and walked on the stage. And I was like, period. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have that much money to throw that in somebody's face, like mm, goals. I don't like how you talking to me. <laughs> but yeah, I would definitely do uh, Rihanna. All right. All right, cool. Since she got Rihanna, <laughs> and then plus, you know. Like, I don't know. She just seemed lit. Like, it just be, hey, baby, what's up? She She's a great godmother, too. Yeah. She be posting mm-hmm. that baby like it's her own. <laughs> I thought she had a kid. I was like, oh, that's the god baby. So, no, I. Like, oh, she be posting like it's her own baby. Mm-hmm. So, yep, she be my godmom. Too. Like, remember like, that, that was uh, me with my little cousin? Yeah, it was. <laughs> I had texted you and like, I hey. That would have been me with her sister, but. Uh, her mom was like, okay, we're going to limit her posting on social media. Like, her her mom doesn't even post. Like, I, it, we're just going to limit posting on social media. So I'm like, okay, I post for their birthdays <laughs> and when I'm with them. I guess. <laughs> and then at 17, all I was using was Instagram. I didn't have Snapchat yet. So all her pictures were on Instagram. Every picture I had of her went on Instagram. That's funny. But now I can post the other one, but I use Snapchat. So I always post, but it's on Snapchat. It's, it's not there for long. <laughs> so who would you do? Um, my pick would be maybe Ari Lennox. Mm. I, she's hilarious. Like, her Instagram lives. I don't really watch her lives. They're hilarious. <laughs> like, that. it makes you want to be her friend just because she she's, she's Oh, wait, funny. can I go back? I want to be Kodak Black's friend. <laughs> He's funny. He is. He's funny. If we talk about, like, funny friends, yeah. <laughs> Like, Ari just really seems really entertaining. Like, she's super down. That She's just funny. And, like, dingy. I so respect like, it. <laughs> we're on, like, the same the same level of, like, dinginess. I respect it. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Okay. You don't use Twitter. I would have told you to go follow. She has, like, people really record her lives and post them to this Twitter page. Yeah. And it's, like, the whole Twitter feed is full of, like, different clips from her lives because they're just so funny. Yeah, I got Now I'm going to make a Twitter just for this. <laughs> cool. Got it. On the agenda. <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, and also we forgot to mention that we're on Apple and Spotify now. Yeah. Pretty so that's cool. that's awesome. Turn so- it. Hmm? Oh, yeah, we're pretty much everywhere. Oh, everywhere. I'm sorry. Yep. <laughs> turn up. That's even better. The turn up got, you see how the, like the turn up got like even better? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, check us out on those. And, you know, we'll see, we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to Crime in a Minute. You can find the transcripts, pictures we've discussed, as well as the links to our references at our website. There, you can also find the links to all of our social media. If you have a case you'd like us to talk about, you can leave a comment down below or go to the Contact Us page of the website and leave a suggestion. Each month, we will choose one for an episode. Please like, comment, and subscribe. It helps a lot.